It's the Bougie Podcast. Proudly sponsored by Cimarron Golf Club. What is going on, Pooch Crew? Thanks for being here for episode 101. We have eclipsed the century mark of the podcast. Perfect timing as well with football season coming back. Officially in August. Officially football every single week from here until the Super Bowl. So football is back. Everyone's happy. The world continues on. The world turns as it turns. We're all smiling. We're all happy. And we're all excited to be here. We are starting today our Jaguars series, taking us through training camp, through the preseason, looking at various positional groups. And today we are here to talk about probably the most important position as far as the Jags are concerned with the quarterbacks as well as the running back room. So I want to welcome on members from the Jags panel. You've seen them before. We got Dr. GM DJ Leggett here and Jacob as well. Guys, thanks for being here. You're muted, by the way, uh, DJ Leggett. Yeah, what's going on, DJ? We got to get that that microphone on. I'm excited. Jags football is, is finally underway. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I'm stoked too. I've been reading up all about training camp. Obviously, I can't get enough of it. Got all the proper follows on Twitter, so I'm basically there. Um, I know you guys went to a couple of practices, maybe a practice, um, but I, I still haven't got to one. But I, I'm definitely keeping um, keeping track of it. Oh yeah, Jacob, tell me about that. You went on Saturday. Saturday was it? So yep. you went this past Saturday, one of the first open practices to the public. Um, we obviously went to plenty when it was under Doug Marone, maybe even a Mike Malarkey one kind of in that 2013 year, Jack Del Rio. But tell me about this first public training camp practice that you went to with Urban Meyer at the helm for head coach. Well, speaking of Urban Meyer, I would say the very first thing was Urban Meyer was the first one out on the field. And, um, it kind of just told me that, you know, he's first one to class last to leave. Uh, but he addressed the fans, and some of you people might have heard about this. Um, he he spoke to the fans. He had a microphone, and one of the main things he said was, "You know, no more, no more other teams' fans, away team fans, taking over our stadium." He said, "Quote unquote, that shit's got to stop." So he definitely is all about building the culture here, making this like a, a home field advantage, and and helping you know the city just grow in terms of you know team and fan base. Um, but no, a lot of good things. Like it wasn't crazy. Um, like Trevor Lawrence looked really good. He didn't do anything that was like absolute, like wild, like, um, but very clean, did his job, was very crisp. The difference between like his throws and Gardner Minshew, like night and day to me. Um, and then the other two backups, it's like, whatever. I saw some good things out of ETN and James Robinson, um, LaVisca Chanel and, uh, DJ Chark looked really good. Um, then the defense, like Shaquille Griffin, is just an uplifting presence. Um, at some point, they were doing 11 on 11, like on the field closest to the bleachers. And Shaquille just looks over to the side and says, y'all are so quiet. And he starts waving his hands, like, just to pump up the fans at practice. So, like, his energy, I think, is going to be um, the main – energy and the main like leader on defense and I think that's awesome because we had a very negative alpha in the cornerback position and now we have a very positive uplifting presence that I think is going to be great um, for our, our defense and I'm, I'm happy you brought that up and I can't wait for a few weeks from now I think it'll be our last episode of the series talking about the defensive backs because I have questions of my own and hopefully when we get there we'll have more answers uh, as far as kind of what the depth chart looks like for the cornerback. I know uh, CJ Henderson is a huge question mark after drafting Tyson Campbell with what was it? The second round pick this year mm -hmm. after using a first when you had Makai Becton available, CD lamb available, you draft CJ Henderson after losing two of your key corners in free agency and trade the previous off season. But let's get into this quarterback situation and real quick around the AFC South, we're doing Jaguar talk, but but I want to dive into the Colts real quick because interesting news coming out of Indy camp. Uh, Carson Wentz foot injury. Uh, Sam, what what are your thoughts on that? What does that do to the Colts? Carson Wentz out for five to twelve weeks with a foot injury. What are the Colts going to do with Jacob Eason? And I think it's Sam Ellinger as the backups there. Yeah. So when I first saw that, you know, I kind of got. I don't know, not excited, but, you know, you kind of feel like, oh, look, we got a leg up on the Colts. But then I 
to saw that we don't play the Colts until was it week 10? Mm -hmm. So it's a high possibility that he's back before he plays the Jags, but um, it's definitely going to put a hamper on their season. I have Jonathan Taylor in fantasy. So I obviously am a little upset that my Jonathan Taylor is not going to be, I don't know, putting up as many points, but right. other than- JT is Sam's keeper. I'm going to write that. Yeah. Down. We're going to have to make a note of that. Spoilers JT on the Fuji podcast. Possibly it's still up for debate. I mean, obviously <laughs> It depends how this uh, what what's what's the guy's name Eason doesn't camp, but um, I mean Eason's got a big arm too, so they're going to be able to stretch the field out either way with Carson Wentz or Jacob Eason. But it looks like their coaching staff is giving the reins to the to the first year quarterback, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean they didn't they drafted him, so it could be it. Who knows how what how it's going to be with the guys taking reps with the first team so we'll see over the next couple of days how he's doing but um obviously not going to be an elite offense but they have a great defense they're a great all-around team still i still put them in the top two teams top three teams of the division obviously but um but yeah so besides that though i want to get into the texans about this deshaun watson the reports coming out that they're looking for three first round picks for deshaun watson kind of ridiculous it seems like the texans you know, are trying to trade him, but there's not really much trade value to these other teams, and they're asking for a third round or three first rounds. So, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, am I mistaken? It, it, are we certain that Deshaun Watson is even going to play this year? Like, is he is he able to play? Like, legally allowed to play while he's in this litigation stuff yeah. and the court hearing stuff? Does is he going to play football? I think that's the issue with like what they're trying to do is trade him. Is he worth three first rounders? We got two for Jalen Ramsey, so maybe, but they have the leverage right now because, or I should say they, they have the leverage right now in a way with Deshaun Watson because of that people aren't going to pay him that much or, or pay up for him, but then they're also at a disadvantage trading to other teams. I don't know if that makes sense. The Houston Texans have a leg up on Deshaun, but they have a disadvantage with other teams in terms of trading. So it's kind of a really weird situation because I don't see him getting traded unless they just give him away, and I don't see that happening. But then does he play, like Sam said? It's a really awful situation. Um, It helps us out just because it's a division uh, rival. So we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, I mean, this this is completely unheard of as a Jaguar fan feeling like you're the team going into the season with more positivity than the Colts or even the Texans. Like year after year after year, we're just, you know, not much to look forward to. And now we're in a situation, Sam, you mentioned we don't play the Colts until middle of the season. The Colts could very well be three and six by the time we play them. You know, like it might not necessarily affect the game against us, but with there being seven teams making the playoffs in the NFL, that opens up an opportunity plus the 17th game that opens up an opportunity maybe for the Jaguars to gain some ground, gain some ground early in the season with a young coaching staff and a young roster that needs all the help they can get. If you can keep those divisional opponents down in the cellar, that helps out the team. I mean, I think we all expect the Titans to be up in the, up in the the penthouse of the AFC South, especially with this news coming out of the, the Colts camp. But I mean, hey, if the Jags finish second in the division, I don't think anyone in Jacksonville is going to be upset with that. No, and even if they don't make the playoffs, I think that'd be a great season for your new your new quarterback taking over and you know a transitional rebuilding year. I wouldn't I wouldn't be upset at all if we didn't make the playoffs, even if we got second place. Would I be right. hopeful that we did? Yeah, but I'm not expecting that right now yet. Anyway. Yo, at the very least, I think we could be comfortable knowing that we're not going to be last in the division for at least the foreseeable future. I don't know. Randall Cobb just got traded from the Texans and he comes out of that facility and he's quoted saying like, oh man, it's like I was in prison there. Oh my God. Like, and so with the new coaching staff, Deshaun Watson asking to be traded, you know, the comments like that, it just doesn't seem... Like, uh, I don't know, it's got dumpster fire. It's got Jags 20, you know, the last 2010s written all over it. So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm comfortable with us being at least in the top three. You hear these things about, you know, the Colts. Um, and, and I mean, the Titans are going to be good too. Julio Jones just got hurt. But, um, I mean. Did he? 
comfortable with where we're at. And Wait, this Julio is... Jones got hurt, Sam. You can't just say that and not tell us what happened. Oh yeah, it was like training camp today, I think, and he he like left practice. With, wow. Um, and didn't go back on. I we'll film in this Monday, so. I mean, he's an older receiver. But... Old news. Well, it sounds like the football gods are smiling on Jacksonville if right. all this is actually happening. But let's get into uh, to some of our domestic issues uh, in Jacksonville as far as our roster goes. Um, great stuff on the AFC South, though. It might be one of the most entertaining divisions going into this season based on storylines. Um, but but within Jacksonville, let's start with the quarterback position. Obviously, you have Trevor Lawrence. Reports coming out of camp that Trevor Lawrence is throwing the ball unbelievably, throwing it better than any quarterback has in Jacksonville in a long time. Jacob, you were there firsthand. Did you notice a difference in his ball, the release, the spiral, anything like that? Do we love Trevor Lawrence's balls? So, yeah, I love Trevor Lawrence's balls. Awesome. Pause. Um, Pause. Yeah. So, anyway... I, I, I definitely was paying attention to see how the ball came out of Trevor Lawrence's hands because he's a first overall pick. Um, he's a you know a tall, strong quarterback. So I was like, we haven't had a dominant you know player at that position in a while, and he's supposed to be that guy. Um, Gardner Minshew played pretty well. I don't think he had a bad practice at all. But the way the ball comes out of Gardner's hands and Trevor Lawrence's hands is different and he didn't have any wow plays on saturday but he didn't look bad i was really hoping that he would throw some deep bomb like we just heard zach wilson had you know in practice yesterday but his pass looks they look crisp spirals they get to the they get to the the receiver fast um it just looked like he just you know did his thing and what was crazy to see is there was some 11 on 11 where um shack actually had a a swatted ball. Kind of, I don't want to say swatted. It was a close coverage um, in the red zone, and then Trevor just fired back, throwing to Marvin Jones for a touchdown and double coverage. I think if you look on Jack's social, you can see that play. It was a, it was a bullet. It was on point. Um, he definitely is just different, and today he had like a few picks in practice. If you're a Jags fan and you heard that, do not worry about that because he's a rookie. That's going to happen. This is an opportunity for him to learn why he threw those picks, and if he rebounds, that's what we expect him to do. If it gets worse, that's when you worry. But I wouldn't yeah. worry about that right now. Yeah, I mean, let's be real. Uh, if you're if you're uh, worried about three interceptions, four interceptions in practice, we're more. I'm I personally am more concerned about the positives, and I feel like the positives outweigh the negatives. Like he's a rookie. Hell, he's gonna have games in the regular season where he might throw two picks, three picks. Like fully expecting that, just simply based on the fact that every quarterback is going to have those games. But what I didn't want to happen was his first practice, three picks. His second practice, five picks. You know, I see reports, and this isn't me comparing him to Zach Wilson or the Jets, but I'm seeing things on Twitter about Zach Wilson completing one of six passes in the red zone, and the one catch was like a six-yard, you know, out route that got ran in for a touchdown, just not making those same wow plays. And... I think the pre-draft talk about, you know, Zach Wilson's intangibles and and his raw talent and stuff, I think that was the biggest thing between Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson was Trevor Lawrence didn't have to worry about all that growth or development. He he came into the league at where he wants to be. Like, yeah, there's room for him to grow, but he came in as an NFL caliber quarterback, not as a a college quarterback looking to, to grow and become an NFL quarterback. So I think that's... That's pretty big. But you mentioned Gardner Minshew there as well, um, talking about the, the way the ball comes out and stuff. Sam, I want to ask you, where does Gardner Minshew fit into this team, if at all? I mean, ideally for, for Jacksonville as a whole and the Jaguars, I hope that sometime in the middle of the season, later in the season, a team who's doing pretty well ends up needing a quarterback, whether that's, you know, through injury or through, you know, poor quarterback play, maybe they decide that they want, um, you know, a jump start and that they trade for him. Maybe we can get like a mid round pick. Um, I'm thinking like a third, fourth rounder for him mid season would be awesome because I mean, he's a great backup, but I mean, if you can get that kind of trade value draft capital for, for a backup, then you definitely should go for it. So, I, I mean, he was great. We all loved Minshew. I uh, almost got a like a like Minshew jersey just because like he was one of my favorite players. Obviously, he hyped everyone up. I went to that Chiefs game where he almost pulled back and won, you know, after he took over for Nick Foles. So, you know, I love Minshew, 
but you know at some point it's um you know he you know he's probably looking for a better opportunity to you know he's quoted saying you know i don't take number twos or whatever so um it's, uh, it's all good you know we love Minshew, and i'll continue to support him for sure wherever he goes um but I, I don't know my opinion is that we don't hold on to him for the entire season i think that some kind of move gets made either before the season or midway through the season well, I'm glad you kind of said that because something that I was contemplating today, I was trying to figure out like who we keep at quarterback. One, do you keep two or three? And then let's say you keep three. I don't see, I don't envision a, a scenario where we keep both Gardner Minshew and CJ Beathard on that final 53 at the end of training camp. If we keep Gardner Minshew and like you say, maybe trade him midway, We've gotten rid of C.J. Beathard because of his price tag, and we kept Luton, whether it's on the practice squad or as a cheap third. And then if we decide we want to trade Minshew in training camp, that's when you keep Beathard. But I don't see a world where they both play. I don't know what you guys think of that. And and if do you you know keep Minshew as a great backup that potentially is going to get moved, and then now you have Luton? Or do you keep Beathard and trade him now where you can have a veteran – for the whole season behind him. Yeah. I yeah. I would prefer the latter of the two options of keeping Bethard and getting rid of Minshew now. And I'll tell you why. I think Gardner Minshew's value right now is the highest it could possibly be. Now, in Sam's scenario, his value would be higher based on events and factors happening that are unforeseen. So, yeah, injuries are going to happen, That, but... If you're putting your eggs in the basket of Baker Mayfield getting injured or, you know, Justin Herbert getting injured or whatever it might be, you know, you might not get any value for him next offseason. Right now is when he is the most valuable to a team, let's say, like the Denver Broncos, um, maybe even the Carolina Panthers um, or even the Indianapolis Colts now. So I say you trade Minshew sooner than later and keep the veteran backup that you really have no plans to move at any point anyway. And I, as much as I love Minshew on the team, I think that veteran experience with C.J. Beathard, we've seen him have flashes of good play in the past. I think that could help uh, Trevor Lawrence, especially through any rookie struggles um, at the beginning of the season, you know, in, the, in the, the early parts of his NFL career. Sam, what about you? Yeah, th- those are my exact thoughts. I like what you say about him having the most trade value now because um, you're right. I mean – Teams are going to judge him on what he did last season. So, I mean, obviously he was benched midway through. So, but then, then you see what he did, you know, the year prior. So, um, you know, he's got a lot of trade value now. I do. I would rather have Beathard and and Trevor Lawrence just because, you know, you don't want to bank on someone getting hurt. Trevor's the franchise guy. You want veteran leadership. You don't want a guy kind of or him looking over his shoulder or, you know, people in the locker room kind of. I don't know. It just seems like that we, we, we're going to move off of him, but um, it's going to be sad to see him go. I would well, say that yeah, I, for, I somewhat disagree with you guys in terms of his, of his price. I feel like right now he has good value because he's one of the better backups in the league and he's young, and we have Trevor Lawrence. But midway, midway through the season, yeah, we don't know who's going to get hurt, what's going to happen, but it's almost inevitable, inevitable that somebody – probably will go down. I mean, Carson Wentz already did. So I think mid-season, if a team maybe has a few wins under their belt, they're rolling, and then their quarterback goes down, that's when they're almost more desperate. Like, hey, we need to get someone in that we think can like keep us where we are, and then that's when you can get even more value. And we're in a good situation because it's not like we're trading away someone like that to then have C.J. Beathard. We have Trevor Lawrence. The plan was never to play Minshew in the first place. But then again, I don't want to get to a point midseason where like our veteran backup that we kept is now what we ship off and we have Jake Luton behind him. So I think I would rather keep Beathard and for Minshew's like sake, put him in a better situation when it's all said and done. Yo, and plus, yo, one, we, oh, go yo, for it, Sam. Yeah, one thing I, real quick I wanted to add while I was thinking when I was driving home from work today is that I mean, Minshew's still on his rookie contract. Yeah, so. he's cheap. And he, so he's got this year and I believe in it next year entirely. So that, I mean, raises his trade value significantly, in my opinion, to any team that's obviously and he, his right. energy, like being at camp, 
something that I noticed with Minshew that that guy is still in him that we saw like on game days. He does this in practice. He threw a touchdown to Laquan Treadwell in the corner, back corner of the end zone during his time in red zone. And he's like running down the field to La- Laquan Treadwell, like hyping him up, cheering, like doing what you saw on game days, but in practice, that's in him. He has a very uh, positive energy about him as well. So I think he's just a great, a great player with a great attitude that, yeah. you know, a locker room would love to have. And so let's just go through the timeline of Gardner Minshew, right? So he gets gets drafted as a sixth round quarterback. Okay. Like the classic Jaguar sixth round pick quarterback, you know, it's like death taxes and Jaguars drafting a quarterback in the sixth <laughs> round every year is what it feels like. So sixth round pick at no point in drafting Gardner Minshew, did we ever think we'd be sitting here three years later talking about his trade value, right? So that's already a crazy, you know, analysis to begin with. So then he takes over for an injured Nick Foles on a whim, like out of nowhere, following, and I'm sure you both remember, one of the worst preseason performances we've ever seen from a quarterback. Oh, yeah. So, like, Nick Foles didn't play one snap of that preseason in 20, what was it, 2019? Um, It was all Gardner Minshew the whole time, and it was sack after sack, big hits. I remember there was a huge hit that it was like, how did he even get up from that? His helmet flew off. Yeah, his helmet flew off. Like, I thought he died. I thought his head went flying across the field. And then and then the dude steps into the starting role, and we end up, you know, winning like six six of 12 games. He went 500, I think, as uh, as a starter for the Jags that year. And then Nick Foles came back, and then all, you know, shit hit the fan, and it was what it was. So I, here's what I'll say. There's a difference between between being okay with being a backup and understanding your role with the team. So I don't think Gardner Minshew's happy or okay with being a backup, but I also think he understands as a teammate what his role is with the team. And it is that guy that's going to bring the energy. It's that guy that's going to be there for Gardner Minshew. So while I, while I know he wants to be a starter, I also know in the back of my mind, I don't think he's going to be that bitter guy that wants to see Trevor Lawrence fail for him to succeed, if that makes sense. Correct. And, and, and just a quick aside for anybody watching this, that's a Jags fan, what you said about Gardner in preseason, just take that kind of memory, how awful it looked and how good it became in regular season. And let that be a lesson that don't let anything that happens in the preseason be overblown, whether it's good or bad. The preseason is the preseason the regular season is almost mutually exclusive. So anything bad might not be a big problem. Anything good may not may be like, you know, over over uh success too. I don't know. So just don't yeah. take too much in the preseason. What speaking of the preseason, so this year, three preseason games, seventeen regular season games. I'm kind of excited for the preseason, to be honest. Well, I'm just excited to get back to football, but I'm kind of excited having a rookie quarterback. Having the, all the storylines, you know, Tim Tebow's in town, Gardner Minshew's the backup. I'm kind of excited. How? What, what do you guys think the playing time is going to look like in the preseason? I mean, Urban Meyer has come out and said, you know, it's an open battle, right? Like, we haven't named our starter. It's an open battle. Minshew was taking snaps from Linder one day while Lawrence was taking snaps from Shatley one day. And, like, you could tell, you know, Urban Meyer is kind of a man of his word. Maybe that comes from his time in college. But, Sam, playing time split, like, does it excite you go- going into the preseason just to kind of see what these guys are made of? Right. So, I mean, last year during preseason, if you can remember, there was, like, several teams that just didn't play their starters, like, at all. They played them for maybe, like, one series the entire preseason. So, and then you kind of see a pattern of a lot of teams – started doing that and then a lot of players were getting hurt the first two weeks so i kind of see the league as a whole kind of taking like maybe a a few steps back in that you know we need our players to get up to game speed in these in the the last two Mm -hmm. preseason games or or maybe the first two even so um i'm excited to see trevor lawrence out there i definitely think urban's going to come out his first preseason playing his players like Definitely to show, look, guys, we're here to compete. We're here to play. We're going to see who can hold up these three games. If you can't hold up, like, you know, three preseason games with just playing maybe half the game, then then maybe we need to reevaluate you as a player, how much you want this kind of thing. But, I mean, obviously we want to look out for injuries, but I do think the league as a whole, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more players play. This year is kind of like the year after COVID. I think there's going to be like a – 
a kind of a step into, all right, we're back in full football form. This preseason is going to be real season, getting ready for this kind of, you know, this real yeah. season yeah. That, that everyone's back. So, so personally, I see Trevor playing like 50%. I want to see um, as a rookie too. I mean, you want to get your rookie way more reps. So um, it's definitely excited um, to, to watch those. And, sure. and Jacob, what about you? Is there anything that could happen aside from injury, barring injury? Is there anything that can happen in the preseason that would change the dynamic of the quarterback room? Like, can Gardner Minshew out there and earn the backup role? I don't want to say earn the starting role, but can he go out there and play and earn the backup role? Maybe. And I mean, I think it'd be like if C.J. Beathard isn't doing enough to be like, okay, we can get rid of Minshew in a trade and, and benefit from that. And then we have a solid backup. And see if CJ doesn't show what Urban wants to see in a backup, then I think they're not going to like trade away Minshew. They're going to keep Minshew because he has played. He has that experience as a starter. And when I think of Urban Meyer, like we're talking about, what the what are the snap counts going to be? This is a coach that's coming from the college ranks that he's not he's not used to. Like, okay, what's the normal snap count we do for game one, two, three? Used to be four. I, I tend to wonder if, if if he might be a little bit more – I don't want to say all over the place because that sounds negative, but I think from the top down, he's used to like evaluating like a college roster and knowing like, okay, I'm going to need these guys in a couple of years. I want to see what all these guys have. Mm -hmm. He might even be you know, more liberal with who he's playing, when he's playing, who's being put in what situation, and seeing some of those like we got you know the top tier that we know are going to play well. We got the mid tier. Who's going to win those battles? And we got the low tier. Are there any diamonds in the rough? And he might look for those guys, in my opinion. Um, and if Trevor comes out and and has a couple drives and looks very solid, maybe he's like, I'm going to you know take him down because he's looking good. I don't want him to get hurt. If he's looking like he needs that work, then he'll probably keep him in there. But I think he's going to really use it to evaluate. And something I noticed with Urban at practice, he is up close on everything. He's right behind the line on special team drills. He is right next to Josh Lambo kicking field goals. He is right up on people. He puts the pressure on you, but he wants to see for himself. So I think he will very much be creative and evaluate his team top to bottom. And I even, I saw that video of him working independently with DJ Chark as well. Um, I think it was on Sunday's I think that's been Sunday. every day. I've been seeing that every day. Yeah, so like he's working on like different moves, you know, from jams and, you know, breaking off the defender uh, from the line and stuff, getting jammed at the line. And, you know, that's a storyline we didn't really talk about was back a few weeks ago, a few months ago, um, Urban Meyer was very critical of DJ Chark, but it makes you wonder, okay, if Doug Marone said those same comments, how would that have been perceived? a lot yeah. more negatively than when Urban Meyer said it. Urban Meyer said, based on his size, he's not putting enough on the field. Based on his strength, he's not doing enough on the field. He was so critical of him that many people were like, how is DJ Chark going to handle this? Now, I'm sure behind closed doors, again, you talk about him coming from college, he's probably extremely used to and comfortable to having these conversations with guys behind closed doors of, hey, I know I was critical of you, but that's because I think highly of you. Like, you're going... Yeah. You're going to become the best. I'm going to get the best out of you. Second, to your point about evaluating talent from top to bottom, you know, at Ohio State, at Florida, you know, he had to look at those freshmen and sophomores, guys that were going to be contributors junior, senior year, and he's looking at guys, okay, I'm going to lose them three or four years down the road. Well, now in the NFL, yeah, you have contracts that can lock players into place, but that rookie contract is pretty much the only guarantee of a player playing on that team. So when you look at your, your time in college, freshman to senior year, sometimes there's a red shirt senior year, and then you look at a rookie contract, he's kind of evaluating on the same timeline of, okay, I have two years to evaluate where this player is going to be in his third year and where he's going to take this team. So um, it, it, that's an interesting point you brought up about evaluating talent there. Um, but, it, hey, if you're, uh, if you're listening on YouTube, for those out there, uh, be sure to go follow on your preferred podcast streaming platform as well. Go like us on Instagram. Jacob was posting some great content on the story this past Saturday from Jags uh, training camp, so that was awesome to see. And with football season here, we're going to be seeing a lot more of it 
go follow us on Instagram and your preferred podcast streaming platform. If you're listening on one of those, uh, iHeart, Spotify, Apple, wherever it may be, go like us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, help us grow. Tell us, tell, uh, tell your friend about us. Um, if they're looking for Jaguar content as well, uh, but appreciate you guys for being here. Let's get into the running back room real quick. A uh, great conversation about the quarterbacks. I love that. Um, can't wait to go back and listen to it and, and hear what you guys had to say again. But the running back room is a very unique situation as well. So unsolicited, without asking a question, Sam, I want to ask you, where does this running back room stand with James Robinson, Travis Etienne, and even Carlos Hyde? Right, right. So I think you got all three of those guys definitely a lot to make the roster. And then, you know, I could possibly see keeping one of these guys on the practice squad, maybe see if somebody, you know, goes down mid through the season and bring him on. But I, I could see us definitely moving toward more of a committee than we were used to last year with James Robinson, obviously getting all the carries, all the catches. Um, but I think James Robinson definitely has a hold of the backfield early in the season for sure. And then as the season progresses, you see ETN work in a little bit more as, you know, the season goes on as a rookie, um, getting more carries, more catches. Um, and then James Robinson's role kind of, I guess, tapering off, maybe, you know, keeping him healthy for later in the season. Um, but uh, Carlos Hyde, obviously, uh, the veteran presence in the running back room. Saw some reports today that running backs were going one-on-one -on -one with linebackers and that Carlos Hyde was having some trouble catching the ball. So, you know, he's not going to be, our, uh, you know, receiving back. So maybe one of those, you know, number four guys, you got Zigbo, um, you got Cottrell, maybe one of those guys kind of fills the role of the, you know, third down running back if we need one. So I'm not sure if we'll keep three or four running backs, but I think that those first three are definitely a lot to make the roster. Um, and I like all of them. They all got bring different things to the table. Um, I'm excited. Yeah. James Robinson. Yeah, it'll it'll be uh, kind of interesting to see how the snaps get broken down. Jacob, go for it. So you mentioned the uh... – the one-on-one -on -one drills with running backs they were doing a drill on saturday um catching catching passes out of the backfield like one-on-one -on -one with linebackers and travis etn really showed off his skills with with just route running and he just with a very sudden but like effective like quick move beat the linebacker i forget who it was and just got behind them for like five yards caught the ball and i was like posting it on the social and before i knew it i looked up and like James Robinson was catching like a wheel route for a touchdown. So I was just about to say like Travis Etienne's putting on a clinic for like catching the ball as a running back, but James Robinson is still very effective. So I really see this as being like a 1A, 1B. Um, I think James Robinson has the hold as the starter, and I don't think Etienne's going to take away from him as much as it's going to complement him. Carlos Hyde's the backup, in my opinion, to uh, James Robinson's style of play. But I think I could see James Robinson and Etienne being on the field at the same time. And I can just think of the creativity. Like, let's say you come out uh, in a formation that has both of those guys in the backfield. But then all of a sudden you motion out Etienne to, to out wide. And now you have a linebacker against him out wide. Do we throw it to him like on a quick slant or something weird? Or, or does James Robinson get it up the gut? You start confusing people. Um, that Dare Aganowale guy, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He made a really nifty um, juke on one of the linebackers too. So when you talk about pass catching, maybe he's the guy that gets it over like a Zigbo. I don't know. I don't evaluate those guys too heavily. Um, but ETN looks fast. James Robinson still looks very dangerous too. And I think Hyde's just, you know, the backup, you know, plotter running back. Yeah. And I, I mean, again, we talked about CJ Beathard as being the veteran backup as uh, for the quarterback position. As great as James Robinson was year one, you have to look at those guys, one and two, rookie and second year running back, right? So you have to expect one of two things. Okay, ETN might have a little bit of a slow start being a rookie. James Robinson might have a little bit of a sophomore slump. He very well could, you know, progress and become better. But I think having Carlos Hyde there as that veteran uh, voice in the locker room, especially playing under Urban Meyer again, like, you know, coming from Ohio State and everything, I think that's, that's a huge um, benefit to the running back room, being able to have 
Carlos Hyde there just to be that voice of reason when maybe one of them has a bad game. Um, you know, maybe some of them aren't sure of their role on the team. Whatever it is, Carlos Hyde can at least be there as as the veteran. Um, but we talked about it post draft in the post draft recap that we did. That Travis Etienne pick wasn't the most popular pick. A lot of people wanted some various pieces that were still available on the board. But my biggest thing after the draft was, you know, you looked at 2020 and you saw Saquon Barkley get hurt. You saw Christian McCaffrey get hurt. You saw Zeke Elliott, you know, uh, regress. His his um, production regressed. Um, Tony Pollard stepped up, right? You had a few guys all over the league kind of stepping up. I, I kind of like the dynamic of having the running back by committee simply from the standpoint of decreasing wear and tear on the body of the bell cow running back. So we've, we've seen injuries happen all over the place. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, more often than not, those injuries happen pretty drastically to the running back position. They get hit every single play for the most part, unless they're running out of bounds. I mean, how do you, how do you guys feel about that? Like, do you think this increases the longevity of James Robinson or even Travis Etienne moving forward, um, you know, through not even short term, but long term into the next maybe four or five years. Yeah. So, I mean, I, let's let's just think about two previous teams that did this last year. Let's go with the Buccaneers, right? The Super Bowl winners. Um, you have Leonard Fournette, the you know obvious bell cow of the team, and then you have Ronald Jones. So there was many times those mid round mid mid games middle of the season where you know they would just randomly hold out for net and you'd be like well what the heck why are they only starting Ronald Jones and then Leonard Fournette is quoted saying like you know I'm loving the coaches are actually focused on my health like they want me to stay healthy throughout the season and then when you think about the season is getting longer this season you have 17 games instead of 16. It just makes even more sense to keep your running back, your main guy, healthy into the postseason. So if we, and every team's plan, every team is planning to get to the postseason. So what do you do? You can't have you know a backup running back coming in postseason and tearing it up. We we call about playoff Lenny. He was available only because they kept him healthy throughout the season. So um, that's great see the same thing with the Jags. You have James Robinson, you put on an amazing year and then you have ETN. So is it going to be like, is it going to be like, you know, the bucks where one game, you know, you feature one running back or is it going to be kind of like, um, like the Browns where say you have two really good running backs and you use one of them in one possession, keep them healthy, maybe one or two possessions. And then you bring the other one on as like a, like a thunder and lightning kind of thing. Like they don't even, you can't cover or these guys don't get tired because obviously, you know, that they're coming out for a whole possession. So I think that we're trying to model the Browns in some way. We're going to have one to three possessions of James Robinson. He's going to be featured. He's going to look great. He's going to get a bunch of carries. And then right when he starts getting tired, insert ETN, insert Carlos Hyde. And now we have fresh legs in the backfield. Urban Meyer's trying to establish, I've been saying this all see, all off season. he's trying to establish a running team like he did in Ohio State. Running team, great defense. So how do you do that? Add more running backs in, keep their legs fresh, keep James Robinson fresh for the postseason when we get there, and have ETN kind of grow into this role of a, of a third down running back and, you know, taking over possessions kind of like Kareem Hunt. I mean, Kareem Hunt could be his own guy. He could be on a team and be great, but – when you combine him with Chubb, it creates an entire offense that teams literally can't stop. I said this in a previous podcast. There was a game where the Browns just didn't throw. They, for one whole possession, they got the ball back, and they were like, well, we don't need to throw it. We'll just run the ball. And it was to close out a game, too. It off. Yeah. And Banny Mayfield just handed it off, and they went all the way down the field with Kareem Hunt because he hadn't played like but like three snaps that game. So you have the defense in the third or fourth quarter, like tired as heck. And then you insert fresh legs of a really talented running back that you know, highly drafted like Kareem Hunt or ETN. It's almost like, it's like a cheat code. So I'm super happy with the pick. You're hearing a lot of reports of people saying like, oh, that 25th pick, like looks like it was a hit. So I'm super excited. ETN's looking fast like he was in college. I really want him to keep that speed. And I know that Urban's trying to build like speed 
on offense. So it just adds to that. It's, it's, it's great, in my opinion. And I think what people need to remember, because this was very – this was very big for us last year, even though we were we didn't win games. James Robinson had a stat late into the season of only having like single digit carries of him losing yardage. He said this year that something that they told him in camp last year was like, don't lose yardage, keep moving forward, like fall for it. And he was extremely good at that. So I think when you have a mix of a guy that he may be not be as fast as ETN. Um, and I don't think he's like the huge, the biggest running back, but he's a very strong between the tackles runner. He can run it outside, but you have him to start out a game, kind of you know get moving where the defense. Yeah, you switch in ETN. ETN has a very strong skill set in the passing game, so like when you need him on third down, that's great. Maybe you have a you know a drive you need to get down the field quick, so you have ETN in to be a receiver. But then if you get to the point where you're in the fourth quarter and you know, you have the lead and you're trying to preserve it. Having a guy like James Robinson who you can just pound up the middle of the line and just get those four or five yards, get those first downs, and really close out a game. I think James Robinson is so valuable, and I think people think because of the 25th pick being used on ETN, oh, that's our new running back. No, I think we just have two potentially great ones that we can utilize in their own way. And, and by keeping them both fresh – they're both going to last longer through the season as well as hopefully years down the road. And like I said, Travis Etienne was showing off his skills in the passing game. But before I knew it, all of a sudden James Robinson did too. So he's definitely no slouch. I think James Robinson is great. I think Travis Etienne is going to be great. And I think having them both will make us very um, formidable on offense and take off pressure from Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I, I think one of the key things to remember just for football fans everywhere is – there's no such thing really anymore as starting running back. Like the starting running back for your team is very, it's a blurred line, right? Like we talked, uh, Sam brought it up with the bucks, like the starting running back any given week could be different. Hell, it's why it makes fantasy football so difficult because you don't even know what running backs to draft based on production anymore. It's like, there's no, there's no starting bell cow running back. And I remember when ETN got drafted, we had put out a video and I said, ETN did not get drafted to be the starter or did not get drafted to take the place of James Robinson. He got drafted to be a compliment to James Robinson and to be that player that kind of keeps the offense moving forward. Maybe the defense adjusts to James Robinson a little bit. They learn how to play him up the middle or, or uh, between the tackles and you bring ETN there to split him out wide, right? Well, now the defense, they've had their scheme for two drives and then, like Sam said, you bring in a completely new guy with fresh legs that's going to be able to split out wide into the slot and maybe catch a drag route and take it, you know, 10 yards for a first down or maybe catch a swing pass from the backfield. Kind of a more versatile player that's going to keep the defense on their toes. Going up against the Indianapolis Colts, one of the top five defenses in the league, that's going to be a big deal. Like being able to trick these defenses that are very good defenses with great linebackers. You know, Darius Leonard, one of the best linebackers in the NFL on the Colts. We have to face him twice a year. Well, it's going to be a lot more fun to watch when he doesn't know if he's going to be guarding James Robinson up the middle or if he's going to have to be matched up with, you know, ETN in the slot because now his, his head's going to be scrambled. Um, so that definitely something I'm extremely excited about. Uh, what Question about fantasy real quick for you guys, and I know it's kind of unfair because we're in the same league, um, but I do want to ask you guys this for those that are listening. Value for, like, Travis ETN slash James Robinson, Where who would you put the more, most value on based on standard scoring in fantasy football? Yeah, well, let, let me ask you a question back. Would you rather have a guy that does really good in the beginning of the season and then kind of tapers off toward the end? Or would you rather have a guy that did really, like, kind of took a while to get going, but then, you know, the last weeks and in the playoffs, he's a better pick. So this is James Robinson and ETN, right? James Robinson early in the season is going to get way more carries. But as the season goes on, you're going to see ETN fill that role that he's – drafted for and obviously be a better pick toward the end so um fantasy wise personally i'm gonna go with the experience i'm gonna go with the top you know 10 running back last year and and james rb1 robinson and and to see where etn fills in because i know robinson's gonna get the goal line touches mm -hmm. i know that robinson 
even if we score, you know, 10 points in a game is able to put up 20 fantasy points. Maybe that won't happen this year, but the talent is definitely there. Whereas ETN, you know, we could see him be really good in the end of the season, but I'd rather have someone personally that gets me going in fantasy early mm -hmm. on and gets me the points. Guaranteed I, points. I really That's do think I that it's going to be a crap shoot between these two guys. Cause we, we're just talking, we think they're both going to be effective for us and it's not going to be a, and either or it's going to be a complimentary thing um i know that james robinson said he was working on his speed a lot this offseason that's something he was working to get better with um if he comes out and he's improved from last year from what he did last year i don't see urban being like i'm gonna play etn more and take away from you just because you know we have etn if he's rolling i think he's gonna let him roll i mean we have two different like big college programs we think of like when i think of him with the gators we had tebow obviously but like chris rainey and jeff Demps, he had like two guys that were really fast and, and then he goes to ohio state and he's got ezekiel elliott he's like well i have ezekiel elliott so i'm gonna use him so if, if james robinson kills it he's like i have james robinson i'm gonna use him etn's still gonna get his but in different ways probably and he's not gonna remove james robinson so it, i think it depends on how does robinson build off of last year if he comes out and improves on it, I think he could be a solid pick. His ceiling will be brought down because of ETN. Um, so maybe that's built into his draft price, though. But ETN in a PPR will probably probably be very valuable because that's where he's going to get a lot of his time if, if James Robinson rolls. Yeah, I have a, a strong feeling that many of these pre-NFL season fantasy you know rankings are going to be uh, fun to watch, fun to see what they come out with with those two guys specifically. It's going to be one of those training camp battles that I think a lot of people are going to be watching just to see what the splits are through the preseason um, and see maybe get a glimpse of what Urban Meyer is kind of envisioning for those two guys. Um, I got to ask you guys this last question. Uh, most fun times as Jaguar fans in the past as far as the roster goes. What, um, Jacob, I'll start with you. I know one of them might be your favorite player. What was uh, – what was – one of your favorite times as a Jaguars fan, as far as the roster goes. What do you mean by that? Like, like for me, for me, it was when we had John Henderson and Marcus Stroud. Like I yeah. loved watching the games because of John Henderson and Marcus Stroud and how they just dominated up front the defensive so, line. I guess when you kind of like what you're trying to foreshadow with me was like Fred Taylor. I'm guessing maybe. So Fred Taylor, yeah, I loved it. This is and this is what we're hoping. Maybe James Robinson, Etn can bring back some. Fred Taylor and MJD Magic. Like, we didn't complain about this back when we had those two guys, when we took MJD with a second-round pick, and we already had Fred Taylor. That ended up being one of the best running games in the NFL, and we had, you know, some games where we just completely dominated, like, the Colts for, like, over, what, 300 rushing yards mm -hmm. or, or something st stupid, where we literally didn't run certain possessions, or we didn't pass certain possessions, and we got down the field and scored, just like you mentioned with, the Browns, Sam. And so I think, um, yeah, Fred Taylor, who I think is, you know, the best Jags player of all time. That's up for debate, obviously, with a lot of people that have lived here. Um, and then MJD, who's a Pro Bowl running back in his own right. Like, that's Jaguar football in my eyes. What you said with the defense and what I said with the running game, like, that pair has been the Jaguars' identity until we kind of lost it in the 2010s. Yeah. Sam, what about you? What about you, man? Yeah, so my favorite's got to be that 2017 season where we went to the, the playoffs, obviously. But that first game where you didn't know what team was coming out, but then that D-line just sacked the quarterbacks. I don't even remember who it was, but they the second half, they were like, all right, Deshaun Watson, your time to shine. And they just threw him in because we yeah, wait, Who was that guy? Uh, Tom oh, Savage. Tom Savage. <laughs> Savage. He Dude. died. Dude. Calais Campbell was his. Well, I, I can't. I think it was his first year too. Yeah. This guy comes out, gets four sacks in that first game, strips them, and then um, who I think it was um, oh, well, Yannick Ngagwe either either strips them, somebody picks it up and oh, goes. Oh, Fowler! I think Fowler picked up the fumble and took it. Right, out. right. So, so yeah, he strips them and then Fowler picks it up. And then you see Doug Marone on the sideline, just like, yeah, and he's, he's hyped up. And that was the best. Saxonville, in my opinion, was what Jacksonville has always been. Like you said, with John, 
Jonathan, John Henderson, Marcus Stroud. Saxonville and a good, strong D-line is where we need to build personally. So I love it. I want to get back to getting after the quarterback and just completely dominating like that side of the ball in the and trenches. I think that why we were so awesome. dominant on that defensive line was – we talked about fresh legs, you know, we had, we constantly had fresh legs going in. And I think the defensive line is like the running back on the defensive side of the ball, where if you can keep fresh legs at that position, you're going to win the battles up front against the offensive line who are not taking breaks. You know, like if you can get fresh legs, high motors, the team's going to come out there and dominate. And that's what happened. Hey, and and guess who we play week one this year, Houston Texans. So, and guess what? They're having quarterback issues. (laughs) I was going to say, you know what's crazy about that 2017 season, too, is that's probably the first time in a very, very long time, maybe before our time, where a Jaguars week one performance hyped hyped us up so much, but then never let us back down. You know, like, because we got, we had a 10 sack game. We were probably on top of the world thinking, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And little did we know we would go to the playoffs. So it's like, there's been years where we, you know, have a great game like last year, and we're quickly let back down. So Here we go one in fifty. That was a very special game, just because that was the start, a big bang that didn't waver, unlike most of our seasons. Yeah, that was an identity builder for that that season for sure. That's a good pick, Sam. I like that pick. Uh, anything else from you guys on quarterbacks or running backs before we hang it up on episode one hundred and one? Yeah, one thing about Trevor Lawrence, already a Jags player came out, I think one of his after press conference, man, like, man, this cat is a little faster than I thought he was. And I think that his rushing ability is going to be a huge factor his rookie season. And I think it's going to surprise a lot of people around the league just how athletically and physically dominant Trevor Lawrence is. You look at this guy on tape, you're like, you know, he's kind of a string bean compared to these Herberts and these, these Jonathan Allens. I think that he's got a little bit more speed than those guys. And all we're all about speed on the Jags for the offense. Yeah. One, so we, we didn't get to see him do a forty-yard dash. Oh, is yeah, it, right. did he? No, I'm no. saying we didn't get to see that, so we don't know right. like what the time would have been. Right, like the old, like the old, the old Lamar Jackson. I'm not even going to run the forty. You just look at the tape, and then you decide for yourself. Kind of he did get 84 speed in Madden this year. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, I will say, hey, if you want to go clock his forty, there's a. I'm pretty sure there's a run two years ago against Ohio State. I think it was Ohio State. Was it Ohio State? Um, I, I know the play you're talking about. I don't he, know. Or in the, in the, yeah. He took it, like it a left, and he just ran right past the linebacker, and then he ran away from the safety. And I'm pretty sure if you wanted to clock a 40-yard dash, you could do it on that play because he it was like a 60-yard touchdown run, and he was he was at full speed by, by midfield. So, um, But anyways, guys, I appreciate you being here. Fans out there listening, uh, be sure to subscribe, like I mentioned, to the Puji Podcast here on YouTube. Like, comment your thoughts on what we discussed. Comment what you want to hear us discuss as well. would love to hear your thoughts uh, moving forward with the Jaguars, NFL in general, AFC South, uh, whatever, whatever you want us to discuss. Go follow us on Instagram as well as Twitter and Facebook and on your preferred podcast streaming platform. Um, appreciate you guys being here to listen. Be on the lookout every week from here until regular season. We'll be doing another or more positional analysis through preseason, through training camp. Uh, It's going to be a lot of fun. Next week, August 10th, be on the lookout. We'll be releasing wide receivers and tight ends. So a lot of juicy stuff to talk about there. But until next time, Pooch Crew, thanks for being here. Thank you for supporting the podcast. And most importantly, go make this world a better place. Take care.